Before we get into the word, I want to play this song. It's by Alan Ashbery, who does All, All About Grace. <clears throat> and the song is called um, He's Alive. And it's, um, it's a song about looking through the eyes of, of Peter, through this whole thing from, from, the, from the crucifixion to him being risen from the dead. So if you kind of reflect, if you don't know the story, then here it's going to be a little difficult for you, but... The bottom line is kind of think about it in your head as you're hearing it, or, or just close your eyes and kind of depict how he, what he's saying in the song. And um, it's just a pretty awesome song. I kind of heard it years ago, and it kind of hit me when I heard it for the first time. And I like to kind of play that on, on Resurrection Day. Oh, do you? All right, good, yeah. Modern technology, hallelujah. Down. I spent the night in sleeplessness and rose at every sound. Half in hopeless sorrow and half in fear of the day would find the soldiers breaking through to drag us all away. And just before the sunrise, I heard something at the wall. The gate began to rattle. And a voice began to call I hurried to the window I looked down into the street Expecting swords and torches And the sound of soldiers But there was no one there but Mary So I went down to let her in John stood there beside me As she told me where she'd been that they might have moved in in the night And none of us knows where The storm's been rolled away And now his body isn't there We both ran towards the garden And John ran on ahead We found the stone and the empty tomb Just the way that Mary said But the one you see there wrapped in it Was just an empty shell
It's interesting that you look at that and um, if you study history, when he died on that cross, like the song said, like talking from Peter's eyes that he, in mouth, that he saw him die. He saw him die on the cross. And they all ran and hid. That's why they, they were closing the doors, because they were going to come and get everybody that believed in him and we killed them all, right? So they ran and hid. Nobody knew anything for, for three days. But it's even documented in history from running and hiding because everything was over. 11 out of those 12 disciples died for Christ. So coming from running and hiding to professing him and who he is right to their death, something happened. Something happened. It would be a fool not to believe that, that something didn't happen. Just because you weren't there. I wasn't there when Hitler was around, but I know my mother was. She was in a concentration camp. I hear what she tells me. She tells me well, who Hitler was. I never saw him, but I knew he existed. Right? Anytime you go into history, you're going to hear history. But history happened. This day happened. Christ rose from the dead. That's what separates us from any other religion. Any other one out there. Tree huggers, Muslims, whatever you got out there. You want to look at any religion out there. Nobody has a savior. Everybody's doing work to get to heaven. I don't have to do anything. That's what made it great. I'm free. I'm free because I didn't have to do anything but believe. And when I believed, he came. And he changed everything. Changed everything. And that's what we have to do. We have to believe. We have to believe. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Let's pray. Father, I want to thank you for your word, Lord. And Father, I ask today, Lord, that it be your words that I speak, not mine. Be not mine, Lord, but your words, Father God. Lord, I ask that what is spoken through this book, from your word, Father, would be truth. And in that truth, Father God, I ask that it would speak to each and every one of our hearts, Lord. That you would speak to our hearts and speak to our minds. That we would receive something that we didn't know when we came in here today, Father. We could take it with us as we leave in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Again, this is the... This is, the, I mean, other than Christmas, the day Christ was born, Good Friday, the day he died, and Pentecost, which we're going to celebrate, this is the, the biggest celebration that we can have as a Christian, the day he rose from the dead. It changed everything. It changed everything. So I want to go to Luke. I'm going to give you scripture because it's better than my mouth not speaking than read the word itself. In Luke chapter 24, I want to go to verse 1. Um, I'm going to go with 1 through 8. Now, on the first day of the week, every er, on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified on the third day. Rise again. And they remembered his words. They remembered his words. Why are you looking for the living among the dead? That's why I don't go to grave, graveyards. Try to avoid them. <laughs> There's nothing there. Really. I mean, my flesh, if I go, if I'm buried, but I don't know if I'm, whatever, buried, incinerated, whatever. But the bottom line is this body's going to be gone. It's not who I am anymore, you understand? And so why are we looking for the living among the dead? This is what the angel's saying to Mary. He's alive. He's alive. How many people here believe that? Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> I believe it. I believe it with all my heart. I believe it.
believable with 100% guarantee. Otherwise, I wouldn't be standing here. I'd be living my life in the world doing stuff I used to do. He's alive. But I want to show you something today, a little bit different. I want to go back to Luke 19.42. We talked last week about Bipolar Week, right? Yeah. How it was Bipolar Week for uh, believers, They're the ones that end up crucifying him. In Luke 19.42, Jesus is coming in on the donkey, right? As king and so on. We talked about it last week. But here, you know, he's, he looking, he's looking over Jerusalem, and he sees a big party going on. And he weeps. He weeps. And he says in verse 42, If you had known, even you especially in, in this, your day, the things that make for your peace, but now they are hidden from your eyes. They're hidden from your eyes. <clears throat> See, this day of Christ rising from the dead is something that, I mean, again, I don't want to get into the whole Easter thing, but, you know, it's hidden from our eyes. It's a deception. The devil has a deception out, out, out there for us to believe in Easter for what it is, right? It's what, bunnies and eggs and, you know, parties and, you know, all that kind of stuff. The deception taking us. The truth is hidden from our eyes. I mean, I don't want to get into the whole story about it, but Easter comes from the word Ishtar. Ishtar comes from Queen Ishtar, who was Nimrod's wife, who was a bunch of crazy people back in the day. It's all demonic. The whole thing of the egg. The egg meant that Ishtar, they believe Queen Ishtar came down from heaven in an egg and landed in the Euphrates River and came out. So she was like a goddess and everybody was worshiping Queen Ishtar, who was Nimrod's wife, who was Noah's grandson. Kind of like Madonna and the ones we worship today that you look out there. I remember, and I still remember this, like two or three years ago, Lady Gaga being here somewhere in, Bu in the Buffalo at the arena, hockey arena. And I, it was close to this time of the year. It was like Easter time. So I said to Victoria, check this out. It was, I, watched, I saw this on the internet. They brought her in for the concert in an egg. Yeah, that's right. Like, where did that come from? Who, who knew that? And now the, the queen of rock, the queen of, the queen of this, queen of that. Bringing it all in, all the deception that flows in. The rabbit had to do with fertility, sexual immorality. That's what the rabbit was for with, with Queen Ishtar. And that's where we get Easter and eggs and bunnies from. But nobody really knows that because nobody takes time to, to check history. We just, my parents did it, so your parents did it. Your parents did it, your parents did it. It came way back from religion. And it has nothing to do with Resurrection Day. And Jesus is weeping because it's hidden from us. And it's hidden from me and you because we don't really see it for what it really is. Because the devil doesn't want us to see it. Let's go to John 2, verse 19. 19 and 20. <clears throat> Jesus answered and said to the religious people, Destroy this temple, and in three days I will raise it up. Then the Jews said, It has taken 46 years to build this temple, and you will raise it up in three days? You see, they couldn't. They were, what were they looking at? What were they seeing? They were looking and seeing through what? Through the fleshly eyes. Through the same eyes that celebrate Easter for Easter and eggs and bunnies and not see what resurrection really is. He's telling them right there in front of them, and I don't know if I was there, I probably wouldn't have got it either, but he's, probably, he's telling them right in front of everybody, destroy this temple and I'll raise it up in three days. He's talking about himself, raising himself up on the third day. But they weren't even seeing because it was hidden from their eyes. It was hidden from their eyes. And it's not that God is hiding it purposely, it's because we have to be able to seek to look for it, and then he reveals I'll show you that. But it's hidden because, you know what? They could care less. And a lot of us sit here and think about, we could care less. But you know what? Nothing else matters. If we don't understand that nothing else matters, we're never going to have those hidden things revealed to us. Because we've got everything half-assed backwards. God says to seek the kingdom and his righteousness, and then all things get added on to you. Amen. 
I'm not good at math. 70% of my life, I was doing it the other way. Many times I had a lot of stuff. I'm not saying it wasn't made proper. Everything I had, it got all taken away. But the bottom line is when I seek God, when he opened my eyes, when I opened my eyes to him and I started to seek him, he started to restore and he brings everything back on. Amen. It's a process that we have to live by that God ordains, not ourselves. But so then the I, ours, I, 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 our eyes are hidden from that until we truly open up. And truly, truly open up. But for generation after generation, religion has been deceived. We've been deceived by big denomination religion. I was for many years. I grew, my mother dragged me around making me go to these religious education classes. What did I do? I rebelled. By the time I was 12, I was going in those classes high. Sniff glue. Smoke pot. I could go on. I'm not going to go on. That was at 12. And the priest there... They, you know, it just, it, it was like one big party. There was a deception going on is what I was saying. There's, there's hidden things that we didn't see. And in that religion, it doesn't tell us about our eyes are hidden from these things. And we have to seek it out ourselves for that personal relationship with him. Because it's not about religion. It's about relationship. Amen. So here it's hidden even to the religious ones. Jesus himself, God is standing right in front of them. And you know, they were very religious. They did everything they had to do. They tithed. They did everything they had to do. They were very religious in their prayers. They would get up in the morning, in the afternoon, in the evening. Very religious to God, but didn't even see him right in front of them. Because why? It was hidden because their all motives were different. They were wrong. The motives were wrong. Let's go to Luke 24. Twenty four, thirteen. I'm going to start at thirteen. Then I'm going to go down to thirty five. Now behold, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem, and they talked together of all these things which had happened. So it was, while they were conversing, they conversed and reasoned that Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were restrained so that they did not know him. And he said to them, what kind of conversation is that you have with one another as you walk and are sad? Then the one whose name was Cleopas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? And have you not known the things which happened there in these days? Now, before we go any further, Cleopas <coughs> was Joseph's brother. So that makes Cleopas his uncle, and he didn't even notice him. Cleopas is the uncle and does not notice Jesus. Okay. And he says to them, what things? So they said to him, the things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who is a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to, the, to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it, <clears throat> that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But him they did not see. Then he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe in all that the prophets have spoken. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he, would have to, he had to go on further. But they constrained him, saying, Abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. And he went in to stay with them. Now it came to pass, as he sat at the table with them, that he took bread 
blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they knew him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to one another, Did not our heart burn within us while I, he talked with us on the road, and while he opened the scriptures to us? So they rose up that very hour and returned to Jerusalem and found the eleven and those who were with them and gathered together, saying, The Lord is risen indeed, and he has appeared to Simon. And they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread. Praise God. So four things I want to show you real quick here. In verse 16, it said that their eyes were restrained. Their eyes were restrained. Their eyes were hidden. They were still in the flesh, thinking of the flesh, thinking not from a spiritual understanding, but they're walking with Jesus. And Jesus isn't going to reveal himself unless, unless we truly seek him. They weren't truly seeking him. They were just talking about stories and hearsay, and this is what happened, and that's what they said, and this was what was going on. And, you know, and, this, and, and go on and on and on and on. His own uncle didn't recognize him. And going to verse 30, it says, Now when it came to pass, he sat at the table with them. He broke bread, blessed it, and broke it, and gave it to them. <clears throat> then their eyes were opened. There was a spiritual communion with them when he broke the bread. And their eyes were opened, and then it, Jesus was manifested to them. He shows himself to them. You see, if you go back to when Jesus was talking, there was, he had followers from all over the place. They're following him along, and then he stops. He says, you know what? You've got to eat my body. I'm paraphrasing. You've got to eat my body and drink my blood to enter the kingdom of heaven. All of a sudden, he's like, whoa, what? <laughs> murmur, murmur, talk, talk, talk. I don't know if we can go with that. That's crazy. He knew that was happening, and he said it again. You've got to eat my body and drink my, my blood to enter the kingdom of heaven. So what happened after that? 500 walked away because they were still looking in the flesh. It was hidden from them. It was hidden from them. They're looking at it from a flesh perspective. It wasn't coming from the heart. They didn't understand. The other 12 were standing there, and Jesus looked at them, and he looked, and he said, do you guys want to go too? Because it didn't matter to him. I could, we could care less. Either you believe or you don't. You guys can go too. And Peter says, where am I going to go? You're the Christ. He didn't understand it, but at least he believed, and he kept moving forward with it. He couldn't get it, but it's like, where am I going to go? You're the Christ. I don't get it, but I'm going to follow until I do. So in going in that, it was the spiritual communion when Jesus had with Cleopas and his friend that it was revealed to them who he really was, and it manifested to them. Jesus manifested to them. Because of communion, because of relationship, not religion. We're recognized through that communion. That's what 35 said. When he said in verse 35, and they told about the things that had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of the bread in the communion. It's record. They were recognized through the communion. You follow me? It's not a flesh thing. It's not a world thing. God never said that. Never did. He did in the Old Testament. Here's your Ten Commandments. Follow them. But he told us to follow them because he knew we couldn't. And that was all a world thing. Because we can't follow the Ten Commandments. We're going to mess up. We're going to sin. Jesus said in John, let's go to John 14. I got a lot of time to kill because I think the food isn't coming until later, right? <laughs> John 14, verses 20 and 21. There we go start at 19. Jesus said, A little while longer, and the world will see me no more. You see, this is the key. In a little while longer, the world will see me no more, but you will see me. See, Jesus is still in flesh. Remember that. I mean, he's still a man. He's walking around with everybody else. He was a carpenter. Union carpenter. Unionized. Might have been a union <laughs> rep even. But he was a union carpenter. 
He was a carpenter. He was walking on this planet for three, 33 years. And he says, but wait a minute, you're gonna, I'm not going to be here much longer. You're not going to see me. Or they're not, the, world's not, the world is not going to see me, but you will see me. Because I live. You will live also. At that day, you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. He who has my commandments and keeps them, it is he who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and what? Manifest myself to him. I will manifest myself to him. What does that mean? That means, you know what, it takes a little work. It takes a little work. To manifest means to reveal, to come to view. See, Jesus was only coming to view when he, when he died on the cross and rose from the dead. He only, now the flesh is gone, now it's spirit. And he's only manifesting to those that have communion with him and believe. And that's what the Bible tells us right from the beginning. In Hebrews, it says, we cannot, ple we cannot please God without faith. I don't care what you do. I don't care what I do. We can do a thousand things every day for God. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. If you don't have the faith, it can care. He, God doesn't care what you do. He proved that with Cain and Abel. It doesn't matter what you do. It's the sacrifice. And the sacrifice he wants is for us to believe in him. Quite simple, but yet so complicated. Why is it so complicated? Because we make it that way. We grow up with all the things we grew up with. We know, we know it's harder for us to come to them the older we get because it's difficult because all the things we went through. But see, through this, when Jesus says he manifests himself to him, that means our eyes have been opened. When our eyes have been opened, that means we can see. And when we can see, we can see what? We can see the breath of life. The breath of life. Let's go to Luke 23, 46. Jesus had cried out with a loud voice. He said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Having said this, he breathed his last. That had to take place. You've got to understand that. That had to take place. He had to breathe his last breath. And I want to go to verse, I'm going to go to John 20, 21. And 22. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you, as the Father has sent me, I also send you. And this, by the way, he's already risen, right? He's already risen in, new, in, in the new creation, who he is. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. He breathed on them to receive the Spirit of life. He breathed. See, Jesus had to take his last breath in order for us to have the new breath of life from the Spirit. You with me? Yes. I mean, we talk about it in Corinthians where, where Paul says the, the old Adam and the new Adam, right? Jesus is the new Adam. It's where the whole, what, what we believe and what we, who we are and what it represents is the breath of life. The breath of life. God spoke when, when in Genesis. You go back to Genesis. He created us in his image. But he created us, but he, what, he breathed breath into the nostrils. So we were, we, were, we were breathed life into us back in Adam, in Adam's day. But when we sinned, that breath of life brought on death. And that's the reason why Jesus came. Jesus came to die that last breath as man and breathe into new life, the new person that we are. The spirit man, you understand, that lives in this body, in this flesh. 
This flesh is going to die, but I'm, I'm, I'm living forever. I'm not dying. What he did to rose, what he did today gives us all that gift. And he breathed it into us. It has to be the breath of new life. We were born through the womb of our mom with the breath of Adam. You understand the breath Adam had from God. And that leads to death. The day I receive Christ into my heart and I become a new man, I bring in the new breath. And that changes things if it really happens to you. I've seen so many where really they don't understand and they don't get it. So it doesn't happen. Because Jesus knows who's he who he's communing with. And he knows our heart. And he, kno he knows our ambitions, whether they're selfish or they're for him. This in itself, the breath that he breathed to the disciples, the new breath he gives us, the breath of life, for who we are, that's the resurrection power. That's the resurrection power. That's the power of God. The power of God. Power. Power means what? To produce an effect, to change something. That's what power means. That's the definition. Look it up. Producing an effect, changing something. Something happens. And what happened with the resurrection power? He changed that death. Oh, death, where is thy sting? We sing it, we sing it. Where is thy sting? It's gone because he breathed his last and then breathed in new life as he rose from the dead. And that's what happens to us when we get baptized in water. You're professing outwardly what you believe inside, that as you go into that water, you are dying the old man, your old breath, and you're coming out of that water a new, a new man with new breath. Now either you believe it or you don't. And I could care less if you do. But it's my job to give you the word. Because when, when we're in heaven and our all knees are going to bow, you can't say, he never told me. I'm going to say, I told you and you didn't listen. <laughs> I can't make anybody do anything. But it's something you really want to do. But see, Jesus is no longer on the cross. He's no longer on the cross. There are no more thorns. The resurrection power has removed him off of that cross. You see, in some religions, they keep him on the cross. But you see, if I keep looking at Jesus on the cross, I'm still looking at the old covenant. And if I'm looking at the old covenant, I'm still looking at the old man. Because he no longer exists. He's no longer there. If I keep looking at him as being there, then I can never look at him manifest himself to me like he manifested to them on the road to Emmaus. I can't see it if I keep looking back. We've got to look forward in the spirit to let him reveal himself to us through communion. That's the only way it's going to happen because he said so. Jesus said, look at... And, and, you know, I've heard so many people tell me in the jails everywhere I go, you know, if God just came down and showed himself to me just once, just once... <laughs> If you showed it to me just once, I'd believe him for the rest of my life. And I said, no, you wouldn't. You're a liar. And I can prove it to you because the word of God, it shows us over and over how God showed himself to the people in Israel and how they stopped believing them days later. Even for, for the same day they were building another golden calf when Moses went up the mountain. It's like, oh, come on, you know, this is taking too long. <laughs> you know what, Aaron? Come on, let's just let's, let's uh, get get all, all our gold together. Let's just make a big cow and we'll worship that cow. Golden calf, <laughs> still a cow. But the bottom line is, what happened? <laughs> the risen po the risen power doesn't keep Jesus on the cross. All right, because I want to live in the new covenant. What is the new covenant? The new covenant is the breath of life that He gives me on the day because of what He did today. He rose from the dead. He rose from the dead. And I see those miracles every day and what he does, if we believe. Rich is heart. God, the doctor even said, you know, that's a miracle because that does not happen. Your heart cannot get stronger. It can't. But it did. God had me headed to a wheelchair. I mean, God didn't. The devil had me going headed to a wheelchair years ago. It didn't. I can run. I can still do most things. Can't fight anymore, but I can still do most things. God can change things. He really can. 
You just have to believe that resurrection power. What he did today, he rose from the dead. The Bible also says all things are possible with God. It also says I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I can't strengthen myself. It's him in me. That's where it comes from, the resurrection power. He's not there. He's not there. And we can't look at him and being there anymore. And he makes everything new. Everything new. Let's go to Romans 8, 2. Someone let me know when it's 4.30 and I'll stop. <laughs> Assume the food's coming right. 8.2. For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Hallelujah. The spirit of life has made me free. Who the Son sets free is free indeed. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm free. I can say I'm free. No drug has a hold on me. Amen. It did, but it don't. Not anymore, because I'm free. God's taken it. Jesus has taken it all away. There is no other way. The way of the world is what? The flesh says what? Here, take your Suboxone. That'll help you get off the drug. That's a lie, because it's just it's worse than the heroin itself. It's a lie. It's all a lie, and it all starts here. Our last adversary is here. In our head. We just can't fight it. We can't, some, some of us just can't fight it. We can't handle it. Why? Because we're not trusting God. Amen. We're not trusting God, the one that wants to have communion with us, the one that will set us free. The spirit of life, the breath of life sets us free of the sin and everything we've done in the past. That old man that breathes its last breath, when you take that last breath, here, I give it to you, God, and bring in the breath of life. The new person, you become born again. And you know, years ago when I heard that, born again, I thought those people were nuts. Oh, there's those born, what's born again? What are they, crazy? Bible thumping, crazy people. <laughs> crazy guy. Think about it, though. Born again. Jesus said it. I didn't realize that until I started reading the Bible, that he actually said those words. Now let's go to John 3. Interesting, in John 3, he's actually talking to Nicodemus, who was a really astute um, religious man. He's got all the religion down pat. He's got every commandment down. Tells people who can get married, who can't get married. I don't even know where I'm going, John 3. <laughs> anyway, three. Um, let's start at verse 6. Don't go there, honey, but I'm just going to, you know, in verse 2 it says, this man came to Jesus by night. So here he is, Nicodemus, a very religious man in the Pharisee religion. Came to he came to Jesus at night for a reason, because he didn't want anyone to see him. Otherwise he would have gotten in trouble, right? Nobody's supposed to be hanging with Jesus, especially if you're religious. Jesus was a crazy man. So he goes to him at night, and he has this conversation with Jesus. And this is what Jesus is telling him. In verse 6 he says, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but it cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the spirit. Nicodemus answers and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel? Aren't you the religious guy? Aren't you the pope? And do you not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I had told you earthly things and you did not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? See, they're not comprehending. He's not comprehending it. No one has ascended to heaven but he who has come down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses was lifted, lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And like Haley said, he, God so loved the world. Is 
eternal life. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. That's God's demonstration of faithfulness to us. That's the born again new life. The breath of life experience that's given to us. But see, it's interesting because if you read the rest of the story of Nicodemus, there is a time when Jesus is confronted by the religious ones when they're ready to hang him on the cross. They take him to get checked out by the Pharisees. And, and John, Scripture says that Nicodemus actually spoke up. So there was a change taking place. He spoke up. How can you, cru how can you crucify this man without a trial? That's what he said. Then, when you go to the tomb... Aramaeth was the rich man that had the money. Nicodemus went with him to put Jesus' body in there. So he openly, now, he went from coming in the dark, hidden to talk to Jesus, to openly, could care less what people thought, took his body to bury him. Why? Because there was an experience that took place. And like Jesus says, and like I say, like everybody, you don't know. You don't know how it happens. Only God does, but it happens. It happened to me. The bottom line is, it happens. And like Jesus said, you don't know just the way the wind blows. You don't know if it's coming from the east, west, north, north, or south. Just like the Holy Spirit, you don't know when it comes upon you. And that's what he told Nicodemus. But that is the born-again new experience that takes place. And it happened to Nicodemus. But see, that's what born-again means. That means the new breath of life that's given to us from Christ because of what he did today. And we have to believe that. If we don't believe it, then what are you doing here? Amen. Go hug a tree. You have to believe. He, he, that's what he said to the disciples for the three years with him. Even though he got frustrated sometimes, he said, how much longer must I be with you guys? He said that. But they believed. 11 out of the 12 died for him. They didn't die from because they didn't believe. They died because they knew the truth. And the truth had to be spread to the world. And here it is over 2,000 years later, we're still speaking it. But there is such a deception going on now where Jesus was weeping. We can weep too because it's hidden. It's hidden. The real truth is hidden. It hides behind Santa Claus, behind Easter bunnies and eggs. The truth is hidden. It's not spoken what needs to be spoken. That you are new. You have a breath of life that has changed your life and you start seeking and he's going to start revealing himself to you. There's a communion that takes place. It's a relationship that takes place. It's not religion. Amen. I'm sick of religion. John, or John, 2 Corinthians 5.17. You guys should know this one. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ... He's a new creation. All things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. The word new here, the Greek word is kaonis. Kaonis. K-A-I-N-O-S. And what Paul is saying here with kaonis is, you know what? It's a new, you're new in form and you're new in quality. There's a change that takes place. When people see you from the outside in, and the inside out, it's like, wow, man, you changed. Your eyes look different. Wow, what happened to you? There's a transformation that takes place. And in that transformation that takes place, you're not the same person anymore. People that knew me 20 years ago would, think, would come here and think, uh, what the heck happened to him? <laughs> it's different. But it's a healthy different because you know what? It's eternal. I know where I'm going. I have no fear. You know, when we grow in that understanding, it doesn't come overnight. But when we grab it, we know because we have a peace. A peace that Jesus said nobody could understand. The world cannot give it to you. Only I can give it to you. And how does it come? It doesn't come from anything but him. And it comes from his breath of life that he gives us. And we start learning and becoming more like him and less like who I used to be.
I go back to what Brian Clancy said the one day around the table when we were talking about how his life is changing and how it was the things that he saw. And he brought up a point with me when we were all doing that one caravan job. We were doing a, a, a thing for um, not Hospice House in Batavia. We were unloading a lot of stuff there in the flea market. And I got a call. Right? And it was like, well, praise God. You know, and, and it's like, okay, I mean, I have a choice. She's gone. So what do I do? I continue doing what God wants me to do. There's a time for grieving. You see, if I, didn't, if, if I wasn't in that place with God, because he told me she's okay, so that's all I needed to hear. And when he said that, it was like, okay, let's carry on. Let's keep doing what we're doing. And I walked through the rest of the day. There's a time to grieve, but that time wasn't there. And that's a whole different thing when we start talking about emotional attachments and feelings and how we move in feelings. We move in love and compassion. Any other feeling is entertaining the devil. That can only happen by a changed life. The breath of life bringing new life into us Amen. and who we are in Christ, not in who we were. <laughs> Cajonus is new. And you know, when I think of new, I think of metamorphosis. And God, I think, created metamorphosis to show us a little analogy of new. Mm -hmm. That caterpillar, the metamorphosis, crawling, getting its way over to the cocoon. It could die, it could get ran over by a car that's trying to cross the street. It's got to get to that cocoon. When it gets to where it needs to be, and that's with Christ, when it gets to be where it needs to be, it becomes a big, beautiful butterfly. Oh, that's just coincidence. How could, you know, that's just how things happen. No, God, I think, gave it to us for a reason. He gave us a reason to show us. Metamorphosis. The new and who we are. The new and who we are. And early on when it said it makes you free, when Jesus said the spirit of life makes you free through Paul in, in, in Romans, make is a process. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. It's a process. We have to work at it. But the change does happen. And when you know it happens, it happens. That doesn't mean you're perfect. Nobody's perfect. We all make mistakes. Jesus was the only perfect one, and he had to be to take our sin away. So that he could rise from the dead and give us new life. Our relationship with Christ should affect every aspect of our life. If we are new... If you look at Nicodemus, every aspect of his life as he was moving on in that relationship and that growth, from coming at night all the way to, you know what, I could care less, I'm taking Jesus' body to the tomb, I could care less what people think and who, if I lose my job, is the big high chief Pharisee. He could care less, he put everything aside because he knew the truth, the truth that set him free. Amen. Set him free from religion, number one, and brought him a relationship with God. Therefore, if anyone in Christ is in the creation, behold, the next word is behold. Behold. The word behold means to see. <laughs> to see. Okay, so going back to what I said early on about Jesus weeping because it was hidden from them. They didn't see. And how it's hidden from us because we don't see. Behold means to see. And to see, our eyes have to be open. And I don't mean open like this from sleeping. I mean open up spiritually to see what's happening. So that when our eyes are open and we do see, we know that we are new. We're a kionis. We have changed. Something has happened. We become new. And only you know that. Only I know that for myself. But what it makes me know that from you is to see you in your walk. In what you do. Changes should start happening. You should get a haircut. No. You should, and changes should start happening. <laughs> it's not a physical change it's a spiritual change Amen. Amen. and God showed us that too man when I first became pastor in Canada we had the church and we went to different places here's a bald headed guy with tattoo tats on his body he's like wow that's a pastor <laughs> I heard that a lot of places you know but the power of God would always come through. Amen. 
Because it's not the outward thing God looks at, it's the heart. Amen? It's not what we look at from the outside, it's the heart. It's a heart issue. It's always been a heart issue with God. We're just blinded to see it. John 10.10. 10. The thief does not, this is Jesus speaking, the thief does not come except to steal and to kill and to destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. See, the devil is the one that wants to keep it hidden from us. He wants us to keep just focusing on Easter and eggs and candy and Santa Claus and this and that. The devil wants to keep it hidden from us, the truth. The truth on who Christ really is and what, where the power really comes from. It comes from him. It comes from him. Jesus said, the breath of life I've given you. I'm giving you the breath of life abundantly. The word abundantly means, you know what? Not just to get you to your point. Abundantly means overflowing. Overflowing. Over and above. More than you can ever imagine. That's what he wants to give us. <coughs> And it's the devil that wants to keep it hidden from us. But when we open our eyes to it and we trust him in faith, that he gives us that breath of life, and we praise and worship him, he blesses us. Amen. I'm hearing the testimonies. I'm seeing it with my own eyes. How he's manifested in the natural, how he's changing people's lives. Because he's God, and you're not. But remember, there's a devil. And the last scripture, 1 Corinthians 1.18. So when we speak of this cross, Paul says what? The message of the cross is foolish to you that don't believe. It's foolishness. Which is true, right? You go outside, people look at you as a Christian, now you're, you're crazy. They don't see it. Just like on the road to Emmaus. They didn't see Jesus in there right next to them until they had communion. Their eyes were open and everything changed the message of the cross is foolishness to those that don't believe. But to those that believe, the message of the cross is foolish to those who perish, but for those who are being saved, it's what? Power. Power. The power of God. And the power is what? To change things in our life. Power means to make a difference, to change things, to produce an effect, an effect of some sort that changes in your life. It's the beginning of a new, like Aeonis. And that's what today is all about. Today was the start of that. And today the power comes from the resurrection and his, him coming off that cross and living eternally with you and me. That's the beginning. But then we move to Pentecost, which is 50 days from now, and that's where the real power comes. Praise God. Hallelujah. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your time. Thank you for everybody here, Lord, and for the word that was spoken. Father, I ask that you continue to bless us in our fellowship, Lord, our breaking the bread together, Lord, that it would be a, a healthy, loving time together, Father. We all enjoy the rest of this day with each other, Father. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Thank you, everybody.